1892 at Stanford University, an 18-year-old student was struggling to pay his fees. He was an orphan and not knowing where to turn for money, he came up with a bright idea. He and a friend decided to host a musical concert on campus to raise money for their education. They reached out to a great pianist, Ignacia J. Podersky. His manager demanded a guaranteed fee of $2,000 for the piano recital. A deal was struck and the boys began to work to make the concert a success. The big day has arrived, but unfortunately they had not managed to sell enough tickets. The total collection was only $1,600. Disappointed, they went to Podersky and explained their plight. They gave him the entire $1,600 plus a check for $400, the balance. They promised to honor the check as soon as possible. No, said Podersky, this is not acceptable. He tore up the check, returned to 1600 and told the two boys, here is your $1,600. Please deduct whatever expenses you have incurred. Keep the money you need for your fees and just give me whatever is left. The boys were surprised and thanked him profusely. It was a small act of kindness, but it clearly marked out Podersky as a great human being. Why should he help two people he didn't even know? We all come across situations like these in our lives, and most of us only think, if I help them, what will happen to me? Truly great people think, if I don't help them, what will happen to them? They don't do it expecting something in return. They do it because they feel it's the right thing to do. Later on, Podersky went on to become the Prime Minister of Poland. He was a great leader, but unfortunately, when the World War began, Poland was ravaged. There were more than 1.5 million people starving in his country and no money to feed them. Podersky didn't know where to turn for help, but he reached out to the U.S. Food and Relief Administration for help. He heard there was a man called Herbert Hoover, who later went on to become the U.S. president. Hoover agreed to help and quickly shipped tons of food and grain to feed the starving Polish people. The calamity was averted and Podersky was relieved. He decided to go across to meet Hoover and personally thank him. And when Podersky began to thank Hoover for his jovial gesture, Hoover quickly interjected and said, you shouldn't be thanking me. You may not remember this, but several years ago, you helped two young students go through college. I was one of them. Remember, the small things you do today may make a great difference tomorrow. You and I have been called for some purpose that we may not have any awareness of. Some of us are blessed by knowing the answer. Some of us may never know. As Kathy shared with you last night, we received just a small portion of what we have done in the past. But what are we doing today? Would you join me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, as we turn to your word and your message this day, I ask that it be from you and not me. May what we hear and what we glean be your message. May it not have been written by human hands, but by your very being itself. Bless us as only you can, and we will lift our praise and worship to you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Talk about a person who stepped up. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. At the sound of their voices, doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe is me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, 
See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away on your sin as atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? May God add the blessing to the reading of his word. In the year that King Uzziah died, what you need to know about King Uzziah is he's one of the good guys. Uzziah followed in his father's footsteps at the age of 16. At 16, his dad, who was the king, passed away, and Uzziah was the one that took over reign of the country. Jerusalem, Israel, Judah, pretty much the whole area. He was in charge, but he was God's man. He, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to Scripture. The place prospered. There was uh, ramparts built on the city walls so that they could fight the enemy when they were attacked. They main, main, maintained a great army because they prospered. The people were well fed. They did not search for food. Uh, they behaved themselves they followed in the footsteps of God. Everything was peaceful. It was great. Uzziah followed the word of the Lord. But as things happen, things change. And eventually Uzziah went off the track. When Uzziah became older, he became selfish. I preach off and on that I really believe that selfishness is a root of evil. I really believe that sin comes from selfishness. And Uzziah began to see himself as an almighty ruler. Because things were great because of his decisions, he decided that he was the one who had done it. He forgot that he was God's man. So he went into the temple one day and he proceeded to light the incense. Now, everybody knew, especially the priests, that the only people that were allowed to light the incense in the inner sanctum of the temple were the priests. God had declared this, and so it was made so. But Uzziah decided that he was grand and mighty and he could do anything he wanted to. He went into the inner sanctum and proceeded to light the incense, and the priests revolted, Isaiah being one of them and they threw him out of the temple. Well, guess what? Uzziah lost his temper. He got mad, he started to fight, but they still would not let him in and God struck him with leprosy. God said, you have broken the law. You have done what was against my decree. And it wasn't too long and leprosy claimed Uzziah's life. It didn't matter that Uzziah was not well, uh, his fo son followed him, and so he took over reign, but he still followed in his footstep, in his father's footsteps. And so things were okay for a period of time, but the Assyrians were on the back burner. They knew that as soon as Uzziah had fallen, that they would be able to take over the country because his son was either not qualified yet or the people were just weak because they had relied on Uzziah for so long. The people began afraid. The people began to worry. Isaiah was worried. Isaiah began to fret. Isaiah didn't know what to do, and so he went to the temple. And when he entered into the temple to light the incense, there was God. This vision came before him. The temple was filled with God's robe. He was so large that he couldn't see God's face, but he knew he was in the presence of God. Seraphim were flying up above. They were tending to God's every wish. And now Uzziah immediately realized that there was God, there were the angels, and there was him. Third level below what he could possibly attain. He realized immediately that he was a sinner and that the people that he came from were sinners. 
And in being in the God's presence, understanding that anyone who entered into God's presence and saw God would die. It was decreed. I believe it was in the book of Exodus that God had said, anyone who sees my face will die. And so he knew. Woe is me. Hebrews interpretation is just a little bit different from what we see. What the Hebrews wrote it as was, Isaiah said, I will be silent before the Lord. Understanding that Isaiah had nothing that he could possibly say to God that God did not already know. God was so much more than what he could possibly attain. Matthew Henry says, this vision was shown to Isaiah to commission him to exhibit truth that would be extremely unpleasant to the nation. And it would have a certain effect of hardening their hearts. In view of the nature and effect of this message, God is represented as inquiring who would be willing to undertake it. The people needed to know. The people had to understand that if they did not listen and follow the will of God, that things would not be the same. And they weren't. It changed. Who had the courage enough to do it? Who would risk his life? And it indicates perhaps that there were few in the nation who would be willing to do it, and that it was not without self-denial and danger. This particular weekend, as we remember, those who stepped up and said, I'll go. No matter what it costs me, I will go. God has called me. My country has called me. I will serve. Isaiah was a leader among those that stepped up and said, I will. I will do whatever God wants me to do in order that we might be saved, that our nation might be saved, that God's word and message might be continued among the masses. It didn't require Isaiah's life, but he didn't know that. He was willing to go wherever God sent him, say whatever God wanted him to say, and he made a difference. Matthew Henry says, Isaiah's response was, here I am, shows his confidence in God and his enthusiasm. He'd been qualified for it by the extraordinary commission. He was now ready to bear the message to his countrymen in this attitude, we, we, you and I, the few, the proud, the brave, can stand up and say, God has called me. I will go. I will respond and deliver a message that God has entrusted in our hands to engage in any service that he calls us to perform. Touching Isaiah's lips with a coal from the altar, the angel said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out, was an act symbolic of God's cleansing and purifying grace. Forgiven. Forgiven. Do we live our call? All of us have been called. All of us that claim ourselves as brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ have been called to serve, had been called to step up and say, here I am, send me. It's our response that's important. Forget, forget what Isaiah said about being a sinner, about the people that he came from being sinners. We are all, all sinners. God is free to make the sinner an instrument nevertheless. In order to use Isaiah as God's instrument, he initiated everything that Isaiah needs to be made pure. This is how. The guilty one is to be preserved from the otherwise inescapable consequences of his sin. Isaiah will be God's mouth in speaking the same call of life-changing, sin-forgiving, repentance upon God's people. Do you know what the definition of repentance is? A life-changing decision. 
an opportunity for you to step forward and say, in spite of all of my weaknesses, in spite of all of the things that I have done in the past, in spite of the way that I serve now, Lord God, here I am. Use me. Take me places I don't want to go. Give me the words to speak. Allow me to be your representative to the world at large, to the world around me, to my friends, to my neighbors, to my family. Make me who you want me to be. Repent. Repent and God will forgive and use you. Isaiah's vision allowed him to see the gap between God and the angels. His vision gave him a view as a sinner, separate from the angels as a third layer. He knew he wasn't worthy to be called by God. None of us are. None of us are worthy to be called by God, to be used as an instrument of God's message, of God's pleasure. But God alone judges what or whom is worthy, and only he can cleanse us from our sins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the midst of our busy lives, there are times that we forget whose we are. We forget the, the baptism and we forget uh, the call that we had uh, to become a witness for Christ. We forget and we judge our brothers and our sisters as less than when we are equally welcome in your presence. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the call. Now we pray this day, Lord, dear Lord, for the, for the direction, for the information that we need in order to do what it is you want us to do. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Amen.